on this episode of TransLogic, Detroit takes centre stage. A private bus company helps with the area's public transportation problems. A demonstration in the city shows how cars communicate with the world around them and a burgeoning bike culture takes to the streets. Welcome to TransLogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. Public transport is something that most people just take for granted or ignore altogether. But in Detroit, it's a much needed service. That's why one man has stepped up to the plate when he realised that some of the city's transportation needs were not being met. Enter the Detroit Bus Company. Andy Diderosi is the president and founder of Detroit Bus Company. Where did this idea come from? I was working in asset liquidation, uh, found some buses for sale, and I said, these things are awesome. The light rail system was, was about to be made, and then it fell apart. So I said, let's just replace that service. Let's just do what they were doing, you know? And so we just put buses on the road and hoped that people would hop on, and it actually worked. So it was just for the public? I mean, did, was there a certain sector of people that you were looking to help get around, or...? We wanted to find a problem that was big enough to matter if we solved it, but small enough that we could actually tackle it. Yep. And so the, the service that we offered was just Fridays and Saturdays. It was from the suburbs into the city, and then we had a circulator around inside of the city. So people could come down, see what Detroit's about, go out for the night, and get back. You know, drunk driving is actually a huge problem in the city because people just think, I'm not going to get caught. You know, why not? And so uh, uh, this bus service really provided a way for people to go out and, and do everything without a car for once in the city, mm. which you haven't been able to do in 40 years. Then we got approached by the Skillman Foundation to start our Youth Transit Alliance, and we rolled into that. So now you're actually driving for the public schools in Detroit, don't you? Yeah, and we're getting kids in southwest Detroit from their schools, their after school programs and home, uh, so they can get access to all these great resources that are out there, but they just need a ride. Right, okay. Who's worse, the school kids or the drunks? <laughs> drunks by far. <laughs> really? Drunks by far, yeah. <laughs> So Rod. Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing, Jonathan? Good, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, buddy. So where are you going today? Uh, I think we'll head to the bar if that's the okay. Bar. Perfect, I got the nice one for you. Awesome. I've been driving since, since December 2012, so yeah. about coming up on two years now. How you like it so far? It's fun, man, I like it. I get to do a lot of a lot of cool things. Get to go to different places, meet a lot of interesting people, so it's fun. The bus system has never been great in the city of Detroit, but recently a lot of lines have been cut. A lot of neighborhoods just straight up don't have any bus transportation. Uh, and if you're relying on that for your livelihood, that's it. I mean, you're out of a job. That's the part that hasn't been done, you know, going directly to a child's house to pick them up, to pick up their sisters, to pick up their brothers, to pick up, you know, sometimes their parents even ride the bus with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then we, we pick them up, we door to door, we pick them up at the house, and then we, at the end of the day, after they're done with their uh, particular program, We'll drop them right back off at home. When it comes to GPS, you guys are employing this technology on the buses as well, aren't you? So parents mm -hmm. can figure out exactly where the kids are at any given time. Yeah, every every bus is GPS tracked, and we share the location with the parents, the students, the programs, the schools. Everybody knows where the buses are. And we actually have each bus doing the work of roughly four buses because of the software that we use yeah. um, that dynamically runs around the neighborhood based on demand. I really think that dollars go a lot further when it's put towards a smart system like this. When it comes to services like Uber and Lyft, how mm -hmm. has that impacted Detroit Bus Company? It actually helps a lot because we want want to solve bus problems, which are people in densities in big groups yes. going from this place to this place. And then Uber and Lyft really help bridge that last mile gap. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get people into the city and then they can get where they're going. So it's actually very complementary to what we do. When it comes to the power trains on the buses, you guys have employed biofuels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we run a soy-based biodiesel, which we didn't have to modify the buses at all, but we have to adjust the mix based on the temperature. It's more costly, it's a little bit arduous, but it really makes a difference. And the buses smell like fried food going down the road, which is really yeah. weird. It's really <laughs> weird. You see like a pretty cool bus driver compared to the bus drivers I had when I was a kid. Do you ever have to get strict? Sometimes, you know, if, if they get out of hand, but you know, we give them the rules of the bus, you know, the do's and the don'ts. Of yeah. course, we want everyone to have fun. Give us your best. Sit down back there. Hey! Yo! Sit down. <laughs> you see that face? Yeah, that's serious face. <laughs> well, it all started in 2011 when you bought your very first bus. Yep. It's grown to quite a sizable fleet now, hasn't it? Yeah, we're at eight buses now. And we've got everything from school buses, transit buses, the big motor coaches. Right, well, we've got four buses behind us right now. Yep. The Silver Bullet, yep. uh, the 
the Loch Ness. Yep. And what's the fourth one? Oh, that's Gordy. I named after Barry Gordy. Uh, oh, really? Motown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a in-house artist that takes care of the beautifying of the buses? Each bus actually has a different artist, which is pretty cool. And yep. so we we put out a call for artists. They submit some drawings, and we we put these are all local Detroit artists that have done these buses. Yep. What's the demand like nowadays? Is it a full bus sort of situation? Do you get a, do you have a lot of patrons? Oh yeah, the bus is full and, and then the demand is high. The demand is so high that sometimes that we have to turn away certain people because, you know, there's a waiting list. And you are actually making money off of this now as well with your tours and party bus, things like that. Yeah, the charters and tours, they subsidize the, the public work that we do. Yep. You know, and so, so through all of it, hopefully at the end of the month we break even, and we have so far. What about the city? Are they on board with you guys? Because sometimes you can get a little bit of resistance from them. You'd be surprised. They're actually really in support of it. Uh, when I launched the company, we got the Spirit of Detroit Award from City Council. Yep. We worked with the Detroit Department of Transportation. They've been supportive of it, mostly because they've got all other sorts of things to solve. So they don't, I mean, they don't have the time to, to, to bother with us. And I think that we are working alongside them. We're really not competitive with the public system. So uh, we're just trying to fill transit gaps. We're not trying to replace anybody. We're just interested in any way that we can make an impact with the skills that we've got. So if that's tech, if that's community building, if that's buses on the road, you know, we really want to find a way to, to make the greatest impact with the small resources that we got. What's the long-term plan for Detroit Bus Company? Have you thought of a big five-year where we're going to be? We want to do a bus to the airport. Right now, there's no good public option that gets you to the airport. Yeah. It's just atrocious that we can't get the rest of the world into the city in an efficient way. So we want to run a, a seven-day-a-week uh, bus service and just, just more buses. We want to build technologies that make what we do easier and faster and better for everyone. Well, from drunken bar patrons to school children, they've got a very diverse client base. Detroit buses, they're serving their community with purpose and with style. And by using old recycled buses and biofuels, they're also serving the environment. It's a great idea. A little later on, bicycles take the Motor City by storm. But first, cars that can communicate. There he is, V2X slows us down, he ignores us, and now we're going to emergency brake. Autoblog, the ultimate automotive resource. From the latest vehicle reviews, shopping advice, and ownership tips, to helpful apps, community forums, and photo sharing. Autoblog, where you can research, shop, and share everything on wheels. A few years ago, the hot term in car connectivity was V2V, or vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Well, here at ITS World Congress in Detroit, another acronym has taken hold. V2X, cars that can communicate with each other and the infrastructure surrounding them. It can be parking structures, traffic lights, even pedestrians or bicyclists. You name it, V2X could be the answer to safer roadways. Okay, so I'm in the car now with Peter Toko to find out a little bit about uh, what Honda is bringing to the world of V2X. V2X technology is vehicle to a variety of road user devices that are enabled using wireless safety communication technology. Yeah. These devices talk to each other. Car to car, it's a software you can download on a smartphone, so pedestrians have that benefit as well. So the industry is really headed in, in a brand new direction. Now the first scenario we're going to experience is vehicle to pedestrian. Okay. We haven't seen the pedestrian, he's down the road, but he's carrying a smartphone with our technology on board. So the systems are already talking to each other. So here we go. The from the right. Early warning, we don't see him yet, but we know he's coming from the right. There he is. V2X slows us down, he ignores us, and now we're going to emergency brake. Thank you. Wow. Now, I should point out, that Zelko never put his foot on the brake. You didn't touch the brakes? The vehicle stopped. He only put his foot on the brake after we came to a complete stop. We are driving through some scenarios where we have a mannequin on a skateboard. Oh. <laughs> you saved that man's life. You saved that man's life. <laughs> if you had a pet dog, you could put it on a, your dog collar, couldn't you? Someone could attach a small battery powered device to the dog to the dog's collar Stop the dog if he runs out car. on the roadway that see so as we make a left hand turn you'll look down the road and you'll see that there are two vehicles in our lane stopped up ahead and we don't know why 
but that lead vehicle has V2X on board along with a front mounted camera. So it's going to take a picture of what's blocking the road and transmit it to surrounding vehicles. And now you can see there's geese in the road. So as we get closer, V2X will communicate with this vehicle and tell it to engage its automatic mode. So now the driver takes his hands off the wheel and we seamlessly change lanes, avoiding any type of domino or chain reaction event that could happen. This is, oh, oh, we're getting an interruption. If we had the radio on just now, the radio would mute, announce that there's an ambulance in 42 meters starting to come out. Ah, so we just got an ice warning from a roadside unit. And so as we start to take the curve, it's giving us a recommended speed for the curve. So for our final scenario, it's going to be a driver in a medical emergency situation. So we're driving along, Zelko has some chest pain, <laughs> and he hits his beacon. The hazards immediately come on, we come to a complete stop, and we send out a signal to all of the surrounding cars that this vehicle is in distress. There, there's a Samaritan close by who has agreed to help. So the Samaritan is coming up here on our left-hand side. Now our good Samaritan has engaged us in a following mode. So now we are wirelessly being towed to safety or a nearby hospital. To, an, to the engineer, this is very good that the driver's not getting interrupted with information. Yep. To a demonstration, you can't see the 200 messages a second that it's processing right Firing now. Firing backwards and forwards. Trying to figure out, should the driver know about this or not know yeah. about this? And it's building a 3D model, a virtual 3D model in its memory to figure out what information the driver should know. How long do you think that it's going to take for this to be adopted you know, in cities across the United States. I would say within a couple of years, we'll have some good test beds set up. Uh, yep. In Ann Arbor right now, there's a large test bed set up. I think uh, NXP has 1,600 units uh, in test in Ann Arbor, Michigan for uni with the University of Michigan. Right. Obviously, GM has announced the, um, the Super Cruise for the Cadillac in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that's going to work in conjunction with that, or is that a different system altogether? Well, it's something we've announced vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication in model year 17 on a Cadillac yeah. CTS. This is something at a later date we could enhance the, the capabilities of that communication even further by including pedestrians. Right. How far away before we can have something in our phones that are able to, to transmit? Consumer electronics change very quickly. Yep. And you know we've, we've uh, talked to some of the chipset manufacturers, yep. and they say this is something that they could you know, support through a, through a firmware update. I think from that standpoint, it could be potentially pretty near term. How do you see Vita-X playing a uh, role in autonomous vehicles? That would actually be like phase three. So phase one would be, it's up to the driver to slow down. Yep. Get him used to the system. Phase two would be, if the driver doesn't slow down within a certain amount of time, the vehicle starts breaking itself to save itself. Yep. Yeah. Phase three would be totally autonomous driving. So. I know right now there's things that, you know, V2V, V2X uh, is kind of one side of things. And then you've got the other side of things, which is LiDAR and, you know, autonomous driving and uh, using sensors and, and things like that. Do you see them uh, as, as one beating the other or maybe both of them combining? I think eventually all these systems come together because there's advantages to each, yep. and so they can each, you know, support and enhance each other. Well, we've learned a lot about V2X today, but what we can take away from it is the sheer amount of possibilities that this technology affords us. We really have only scratched the surface of a technology that is really only limited by our imagination, and if it's fully adopted, will vastly change the way that we get around, and will do so far more safely. Up next, we take a look at Detroit bike culture. It just done blew up just crazy. I can't explain it. Motor City is known for just that, motors, and for a rich manufacturing history. We cruise the streets today, and you'll notice a two-wheel takeover. We're talking bicycles, and lots of them. There's a strong biking community, and even some quality manufacturing alive and well in Detroit. Before we get started, I want to draw a couple of parallels here. I don't know if I'm correct in saying this. So Henry Ford II. In the flesh. Yep. Now, your first bike that you offered here at Detroit Bikes was yes. the A-Type. Correct. Only offered in black. Correct. Henry Ford 
made the Model T, offered it only in black as well. Correct. Is that something going on here, or is that just in my It's an absolute, purposely done model behind Henry Ford and his production. It has established Detroit as a city primarily as a manufacturing city. Yeah. And the idea that we're trying to do here at Detroit Bikes is to get that reestablished as Detroit being a production manufacturing city. Detroit Bikes is proud to be here and, and building everything right here in this 50,000 foot. Everything. We, we take raw material, we cut, we weld, we cope, we paint, everything. Our long-term goal is to be the number one producer of bikes in the States, hopefully soon to be the world. At $699, mm -hmm. obviously, you'd be expecting a lot higher quality, wouldn't you, than, say, some of the Chinese bikes that you're going to find in various big outlets? Absolutely. Our A-Type, specifically built for city biking, very durable. We uh, warranty our frame for a lifetime. <laughs>
whole new way to look at how you get around. And cycling has not only become more efficient, cheaper, healthier, easier way to get around in an urban environment, it's also really cool. You've obviously kicked a massive goal with the slow roll. You do it every Monday night, and you're averaging over 3,000 people per week. That's incredible. What we do every week is we pick, we pick a different restaurant or bar that needs our help that usually isn't even open on a Monday. So when you talk about being able to bring three to 4,000 people to a business or a region like yeah. that economically, you're not just talking about diversity, you're talking about real hardcore finance that's happening in the city of Detroit and what we need. And, and when you're talking, we're right up there when you're talking about the Tigers, you're talking about the Red Wings, we're bringing revenue to the city. You do a lot of stuff for the community as well, don't you? Uh-huh, we, we help with the garden around the corner sometimes and we pick up trash, we feed the homeless with that grill. The Dude, grill bike. <laughs> if you, you're not gonna get one of my t-shirts if you don't do no community service. Right. You're not gonna get a jacket, you're not gonna get a hat, you're not gonna get nothing if you don't do no community service. You have your own special ride, the Eastside Riders Night, so why is it you think there's been such a resurgence in cycling? People's been seeing our bikes. It just done blew up just crazy. I can't explain it. They say, oh, Detroit is dangerous. Every city is dangerous, but all in the same time, when you own these bikes, it's nothing but love. Looking around as well, you can see there's a whole cross-section of the community there. I mean, there's really people from all walks of life that are coming together just to ride bikes. Detroit has always been diverse. There have just been things that have made people sort of shift in different ways. But we've always wanted to live next to each other and hang out with each other. And this ride was just the catalyst for it. Not only do we get to experience on the ride, but you see people coming out of their houses and it's not just a one homogenous group of, it's everybody. And it really has an effect on our riders, has an effect on the people that see us because it's, it's hope. Well, while we're not gonna make some kind of sweeping statement about how bikes are going to save the Motor City, community efforts like the Eastside Riders, the Slow Roll, and companies like Detroit Bikes are definitely helping to keep this storied city and its cyclists moving forward. For TransLogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. We'll catch you next time.